Welcome back to my channel. I can already feel that my energy is off for this. I'm usually like so happy like hey boobs welcome back to my channel and today I'm just like a few minutes away from slitting my wrists. Okay so this whole video needs a trigger warning. Um, I'm gonna say it now there is a lot of um, dark things in this video that some people may find uncomfortable offensive, I don't know if offensive is the right word, but they might find um, triggering. So this whole video started, sorry if you can hear my fan, like I'm, I'm, I'm so nervous. Knees weak, arms are heavy, palms are sweaty. This whole video started with a TikTok. A TikTok? A TikTok. I was filming a video the other day about my hair and after it was done, while I've got my makeup on, I like to film a TikTok because I'm like, all right, okay. We've done a YouTube video, now let's do a TikTok. It was one, and I have to laugh, otherwise I will implode. And it was one with a wake me up bit George Michael, and it kind of wavers off, so I'll put it here. And the first time I heard that sound on TikTok, I was like, this is literally the epiphany of when my mind just let loose everything that I had kept locked away. It was like this. So I thought, you know what, I like to make light of my horrible life. And so I made a TikTok and I was like, oh, because that's kind of therapy to me. Talking to you guys now, like this whole video is therapy. It's my way of getting things out of me when they just build up a little bit too much because I don't talk to anyone. I don't like to talk about my feelings, but you know, little bit, little video here and there keeps me feeling safe and that I, I can handle I can handle things. So I made that video and I actually didn't think anything else of it. I just thought, oh, people would find it as funny as I did because I, and, and please don't take that the wrong way. I, I, nothing is funny about what I went through, but I have to find the humor in the darkness. Otherwise I will. <laughs> so what happened was I ended up getting so many comments on Instagram and TikTok and DMs from you guys saying the same thing. It broke my heart because it was, all of a sudden it was like, it took that humor out of the video for me. It was like, oh, <laughs> wow, this is not a joke. And I know it's not a joke. Oh my God, am I crying already? We've got a long way to go, Emily. Like, don't start yet. It made me confront the seriousness of what actually happened. And someone messaged me on Facebook. I'm oh, sorry. Oh, come on, Emily. So I had a message on Facebook and TikTok that said, if you can, we would really appreciate a story time on this because, because I have a platform, which I need because I'm four foot 11, it could help someone. And as soon as you say that to me, it could help someone. I'm like, right, I will do it. I will be the savior of the beaten, the broken and the damned. So here I am, this is me attempting to tell my story. Now I want to say before we get into it that every single thing in this video is 100% true. This isn't a Tana Mongoose story time. This is 100% true from the memories as best as I can remember and feeling from the bottom of my little black heart. So when I met the guy, a load of you know his name, but I'm not gonna say it on this video. It was in Ipswich Town Centre and I had just, I was 14. I was 14 years old and I was hanging out at the skate park with my friend. Well, he was a skater boy. Little was like, I think I had my brother's Slipknot hoodie on because my mum wouldn't buy me one. And we had just gone from the skate park and it was on a Sunday, I think. I can't remember, we needed to go get some food or something. So we went to Boots and the closest shop that was open was Tower Ramparts, which is a big shopping center and we went to the toilets in there. Now outside their toilets at the time, there was like steps. So you walk in, there's steps, and then one side was the ladies' toilets and the other side was the men's toilets. And he was sitting on the steps. I don't know what he was doing. You know, me and my friend went to the toilet. We were being like stupid 14 year olds. Oh my God, I'm gonna talk to him. I'm gonna talk to him. <laughs> we came out the toilets and we started speaking to him. We were chatting like, I don't know, stupid shit. We exchanged phone numbers. When we left, I don't know how, but we kissed and it was a, like one of those kisses. And it was, and it went on, I was, I'm, now I'm saying this, I'm like, you can tell I was a fucking child. I remember when we were kissing, I went, 
<laughs> like some kind of theme tune or something. And then he put his tongue in my mouth. So then we were snogging and then my friend came and dragged me away. I think at the time she was jealous because she liked him and was like, oh my God, girl, <sighs> you can have him. We were messaging each other, we were texting each other and I told him everything. I'm a very open person. I always have been. You can ask me anything and I will tell you the goddamn truth. I told him my age and I told him that I was on weekend leave from a psychiatric hospital. This is 100% true. When I was 14, I was committed to the Priory in London because I had tried to commit suicide and I had really, really bad depression, which has never gone away. But I've just learned to deal with it and hide it better. When you're in psychiatric unit, you can, you are there 24 seven and you earn rewards. So I had earned weekend leave. I think we met on a Sunday and I had to go back every Sunday evening. So late Sunday evening, the hospital would send a taxi to come and get me and drive me back to my prison. So I got back to the hospital and we were messaging for that whole week. I remember sat in my room, um, my, my little hospital room, which was actually really nice. One of the other rewards you got was when you were there, when you first get to hospital, you have a nurse sit in your room 24 7. They watch you piss, they watch you shit, they watch you bath. You cannot shave without a nurse, because you can't have razors, without a nurse sat there watching, like eagle-eyed watching you. With my weekend leave came a, um, a nurse just checking on you every hour, so you didn't have to have them with you 24 7. They would just knock on your door, come in, everything all right, every hour on the hour, like including night. They didn't ask you if you were right, but they'd come over and make sure you were still breathing. I remember being in my room watching Home and Away because I've never watched Home and Away and I don't plan on ever watching it again. But they only had the basic analog channels and all I would watch every day, because I didn't realize Home and Away was on like two, three times a day. Um, so all I would watch was Home and Away <laughs> and Trisha. Oh my God, I love Trisha. After a week of texting, um, we discussed everything you know like puppy love like this is how old I am this is where I go to school this is where I am at the moment he knew where I was because um, at a later date he did come up and visit me so he was fully aware that I was a very vulnerable 14 year old the Saturday after we met we met up in Christchurch Park so when you go through the side entrance of Christchurch Park there is a little like mud verge and we just sat there for hours like literally hours just talking talking about everything i can't remember if it was then or before then that he told me he was 23 but at 14 you don't care do you? you you know better you know better at 14 you know what's good for you so what happened was he asked me to stay at his house i remember phoning my mum in christchurch park using his phone because i had no credit because i was a 14 year old who it was like top-up card days you know, i phoned my mum and I said to her, I'm gonna stay at my friend Kerry's house. Like Kerry um, from Stoke, if you're watching. <laughs> I'm gonna stay at my friend Kerry's house. Is that okay? And then her mum will bring me back in the morning. I had no idea how I was gonna get home in the morning. A Sunday morning, staying, I've got no fucking idea where, no idea how I'm gonna get home, but you don't think about that, do you? My mum said it was fine for me to stay at my friend's house. And, and that that was where it all happened. So before that, we had only had that one kiss in, in Tower and Plaza. <laughs> Like that makes me, that makes my skin crawl to think about that. That's something my daughter does, who's, my daughter's seven. Like that's something that she does. When we have a kiss, she'll, she'll make a little noise. I'm like, that's what children do. I can't remember if we both went or I waited in the park and he went, but somehow, some way he went and got us alcohol. There was no fucking way that I could ever buy alcohol. We used to drink White Lightning a lot. Like White Lightning is like a big bottle of 2 99 cider and it's just chemicals and it's disgusting and it will just get you wasted and it's just vile. White Lightning, uh, Frosty Jacks, all those terrible ones. We sat in Christchurch Park, got drunk, not super duper drunk, like kind of tipsy. And then I don't remember how we got to the bus stop, but the bus stop isn't very far away. And then I remember being on the bus going to Chantry and I remember walking from the bus stop and it was dark. Now I'm saying this, I'm like, you stupid person. You had no idea who this person is. No one knows where you are. You're drunk, you're vulnerable. He could have done anything to you and nobody knew where you were. But at the time you don't think about that. And I'm so, I'm actually so ashamed that I didn't think about that. But I think I was just so, 
desperate for love like because I was alone in this hospital oh god don't cry and he showed me that little bit of what I needed so here we are we're at his house um I don't remember what I don't remember how long we were there but it was that night um he put a white zombie album on and we were continued drinking and and we had sex that was the night I lost my virginity so I lost my virginity at 14 to a white zombie album to this guy that I had known for a week and and that was it I remember waking up in the morning and he was looking at me and I will never forget this because I just woke up like and he was just like and I thought that was really cute but now I'm like nothing in this story is cute uh, we had sex again and then he got his landlord because I had no idea where he lived I didn't know if he lived with his parents in a flat in a house he lived in a house share and he got his landlord to drive me home that was awkward so again I'm with another stranger who now knows where I live because he drove me home who later turned out to be a we'll get on to him later and then I went back to hospital and I was telling I I don't know how I can't remember how but either the nurses or my friends in the hospital found out that I had had sex and it was unprotected because I was 14 I wasn't expecting to have sex so I had to take the morning after pill and for the hospital to give me that they had to phone my mum so I had to tell my mum on the phone everything I was well I, I did it in a I'll tell you everything way it's like oh I met you know it's just a friend I known him a long time I was going off the rails long before this so my mum thought I was uh, my mum thought I was out having sex with everybody um but I, I wasn't H having me phone her and say I had to take the morning can I have permission to take the morning after bill it didn't surprise her like I don't remember her being surprised I remember her being like okay thank you for telling me my mum and I were not close at the time we are really close now but at the time we weren't she had her own issues with my brother and her her own things going on and and I have never been someone who likes to talk to people so I never spoke to her Anyway, like this is gonna be a really long video and I don't want it to be. After I got out of the Priory, I went back to school and it wasn't for long because it was like the end of the year. Of course, everyone looked, everyone knew, everyone knew where I was. So everyone, like, so I got bullied a million times worse than before I went there. I frequently would walk out of school. I would be messaging him, be like, can you come and get me? I can't be here. People are being mean. Like, I, this is not good for me. So he would meet me at school and I would just bunk off. I was bunking off school anyway before all this because it's just what I did. So he would meet me at school and then social services got involved. I thought my mum had called social services but I only found out recently actually when I was talking to my mum about all this that my school phoned social services. High five school, you did fuck all about the bullying but at least you tried to save me from a predator. And we had a meeting separately and together with social services and we both convinced them that we were not having sex, we were literally just friends. And I don't know how but social services accepted this. They accepted it and I never saw them again, never had another meeting, never had anything to do with social services again because I said we weren't having sex, he said we weren't having sex and that was it, that's all they needed. 14 years old, blatantly lying, hanging around with a 23 year old. With the naivety of being 14, it was bound to happen. Never said this on my channel, so um, I'm gonna try not to cry. I got pregnant, I was with my friend in Woodbridge and we went to Boots stole a pregnancy test and went to the the public toilets in Woodbridge they're really really posh and did a pregnancy test and it came back positive and I was 14 and um it's so funny because it's not funny it's not funny but I have to find the humor in stuff otherwise I will shoot myself in the face so what happened was I remember I remember the second that test came back positive and all of a sudden like my back hurt I had to push my belly out I was walking around like this all the things that heavily pregnant women do. Oh, all oh my feet hurt. I need to sit down. I need to sit down. I need to sit down. I must have been about a month pregnant, but in my head it was like, no, no, everyone must do everything for me now. <laughs> I had a miscarriage. So the smile's going to drop now. I had a miscarriage um, a few, uh, not long after, like a week or two. I can't actually remember, to be honest. I had a miscarriage not long after and uh, I never told anyone. Never told my mum. Never told 
my friend knew and the guy knew and that was it. I didn't tell anybody else. I didn't go to hospital, I didn't go to the doctors, which is really stupid because there could have been pieces still in there that hadn't come out. Sorry, that sounds really gross, but you need to get checked up after something like that. But I only had my one friend and I only had the guy. I had no other friends, so I had no one else to support me and that one friend was just as messed up as I was so like she, she got her own stories so I, I didn't really have that stable support network and I was discharged from the hospital by this time so I, ha I had no one to go back and like talk to a nurse about it I had no one like I said me and my mum didn't get on I moved out of her house at 15 and moved in with him I mean I was pretty much staying with him a lot anyway but um, I moved in with him officially when I was 15 and we had to go to the council to get council to like pay my rent and everything because I wasn't working, I was 15. I wasn't in school. I left school at 15, I, I was doing nothing. I did eventually get on a Prince's Trust course which I'm so grateful for because that gave me so much confidence and did a lot of good for me. So thank you Prince's Trust. But I moved in with him at 15. That was a house of horrors. A house of fucking horrors. It was a house share. If you don't know what a house share is, you, you rent a room and then you share the bathroom, you share the living room, which we weren't allowed in, you share the kitchen. We were essentially like confined to our room all the time because neither of us worked. So it was just stuck in our room watching films all day, which sounds great. But then you think, well, she's 15, he's now 24. This is not right. <laughs> but that house was bad. That house was really, really bad there was shit on the shower head one day when I went to take a shower like actual actual sh like it had been up someone's ass later found out that the landlord of the house we lived in had child pornography on his computer I think we had split up at this point when I heard that there was spunk on the floor one day now I'm you know I, I know what spunk looks like <laughs> not in our room in um it was in another room Oh, sorry, like just thinking about it, thinking that I lived in this home. There was oh, bugs in the kitchen. It was freaking disgusting, disgusting. My depression had gone way down. By the time I was 16, 15, 16, we were doing a lot of drugs. We were doing, we were drinking every weekend. I've never really been a drinker, but I became a binge drinker. Even now, I don't really drink very often. I only drink when I go out. All the alternative kids used to hang around the town hall days and I was drunk every Saturday that we would go there because I had nothing else. I had nothing else to do. Again, again, I was 15 at this 15, 16. I can't buy alcohol. You have to be 18 to legally buy alcohol in the UK. So he was the one who always bought my alcohol. And we have a shop here called The Purple Shop. And at the time, you could buy magic mushrooms there. I used to work at The Purple Shop. You could buy shrooms. And we used to do them a lot. And they used to sell, I don't know if they still do because I don't go in there anymore. Um, they used to sell legal highs. We used to do them a lot. We smoked weed. You name it, we did it. We did so many drugs. And again, I'm 15, 16. I can't buy these things. He had to buy them for me. Like, I'm getting angry reliving everything. Because I relive these things. You know, I'll be doing something and it'll just pop in my head. Like, but it'll only be a snippet. I've got to wipe my glasses. There's tears on them. It'll only be a snippet. But to sit down and actually hear everything in one go, and this isn't even everything. There is so much more to this story that I'm not gonna talk about. It's crazy to me how at this point, we were having sex at 14, the school called social services, I was drinking, doing drugs. People knew this. I, I had no friends, but people around me, the landlord, the everybody around me knew what was going on and nobody, Nobody said, oh, okay, here they go. Hold on, <laughs> this ain't right. To be fair, if my mum, me and my mum weren't close again, as I don't want this to come off bad against my mum because I love my mum so much. But to be fair, even if she had have said to me like, this isn't right, I, I wouldn't have listened to her. I, I, I was 14, I knew better. Um, I have also since found out when she was 14, 15, she was in a very, very, very similar situation. So that might be why it was a little bit harder for her to register why it was wrong. Where am I? Where am I at? At this point, I had fallen out with my friend, the, the one girl friend that I had. We had fallen out. I can't remember why. Um, but I had gone on holiday with my dad and I met a guy on holiday and he became 
the best friend I ever I'm gonna cry now. He became the best friend that I ever had. His name was Tom. And I've spoken about Tom before and he lived in Derbyshire. Um, I think I was about 15 at this time and he was 16 and he came to stay with me at, we stayed at my mum's house. My ex did everything he could to stop us being friends. He broke up with me. He broke up with me. He was like, well, if you're going to be friends with him, I don't want to be with you. And obviously as a teenager, you're like, oh my God, my life is over. Evidently he made me choose and I, ch I chose wrong. Stop talking to Tom, obviously because he lived so far away. We didn't, I never had to see him. So he moved back, he went back home and I just cut off talking to him. And I actually reached out to him last year. It was lockdown that uh, made me want to confront everything that I have gone through. It made me want to like stop locking everything away. I wanted to, I wanted to deal with it. So I tracked him down and it took me a long time because he's changed his name and he doesn't have Facebook. <laughs> and, like, so I ended up finding a friend who lived where he lived and was like, do you know this guy? Like, can you please help me find him? And I found him, I found him on Instagram and I sent him a message like, hey, remember me? I'm the one who fucked your life up. Like we had matching tattoos. We were so freaking close. And um, and I sent him a message and we spoke for a little while and that was, <laughs> I hate crying, I'm an ugly crier. He said he forgave me. That was so much relief. Like I didn't realize how much I needed to hear that. We were like, we like drank each other's blood. We were like so freaking close. The last time I spoke to him, he told me he was on a bridge and he, was gonna jump and he just needed to talk to me. And my ex took the phone out of my hand, deleted his phone number, and that was it. I never spoke to him again. I didn't know what happened to him. I didn't know, and because he changed his name, I couldn't find him anywhere. So obviously when I looked for him, trying not to have a breakdown, like, did he fucking do it? Am I the reason he did it? Like, luckily he's okay. Um, even though this whole video is about how I was hurt because I was so hurt, I was hurting people. And yeah, I, did, I hurt him so much at the time. And I, I, he seems to have got past it now. We were chatting and, and, and it was like, I obviously still dwelled on this a lot because things like this haunt me. But he was like, no, I'm fine. Like, I, I'm fine, I'm in a good place. This is what manipulators do. They cut you off. They cut you off from your friends, from your family. And I couldn't see it at the time. All I could see was, all I could see was, oh, he loves me so much that he just wants me all for himself. Like now I can see with clear vision that no, it's manipulation. It's keeping you in one place, not letting you have friends. But I, I couldn't see that because I was so young and vulnerable. Uh, this all went on till I was 18 and I had finished my Princess Trust courses and I started college. And this was the best thing that ever happened to me, aside from my husband and my daughter, starting college, changed my world. Things started to like go up. He had he had a job in a video rental store where he robbed one of the girls that I kind of, that I have on Instagram and uh, yeah, he robbed her. He told her that we were going to see Marilyn Manson and we did go and she gave him money to get tickets and he didn't get tickets, he spent it on drugs. It was actually that concert that she was supposed to go to where we got noticed for a TV show. And I know a lot of you have seen the TV show and it was there that we got on the show. And um, it's funny, cause if you watch it now, they spelt his name wrong and they got our ages wrong. And I don't know if they did that on purpose. I get so many comments on that video. Um, people would write things about the age gap, even though it's wrong, like they made it smaller. And I would always delete those comments. Um, just cause it was like, Oh, you don't know. You don't know. On the outside, this is, yes, that's what it looks like, but you don't know. You weren't there. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I still delete the comments because I don't want them on there, but what you're saying is true. Um, he, yeah. Oh, makes my skin crawl. Um, and I was in college, so things were getting better because I was getting my confidence. I was getting my independence. I was making friends. One friend I met at college is my world and I'm she's still one of my closest friends to this day. I went to college and I was with my friend, which is amazing, and I just started to get my independence. Things, I started to like have, that was the first time I had doubts was when I was in college and it was like all these people my age were, cause I was 18 at this point, so he would have been 27 and I, 
got pregnant. Again, I've never said this on my channel. And I, I'm gonna keep certain parts of this back, but I, um, I got pregnant and I had, something happened at five months and I had to give birth at five months. Baby was, sorry. <laughs> God, I'm shaking. <laughs> Baby was not alive. And then I think we, to deal with that trauma and that like, that pain. <laughs> sorry, I'm trying not to cry. I'm trying to get my story through and like tell you it honestly without sitting here trying to get sympathy. That's not what this is. I'm trying to help people by see, hoping hoping that you'll see if you're in a similar situation, like get the fuck out. <laughs> and um, so after that, we got married. I think it was the, um, I think it was the, like I, I was in a completely different place. He started doing more drugs, smoking weed like every fucking day, doing what God knows what, stealing my money. I was getting money from college and he and he was working but it was like he was working at the alternative shop but it was like a self-employed role and i'm to this day i'm still not sure what how that how he got paid from that job because we never had any money always he would steal my money but it was always the same thing i'll pay you back babe i'll pay you back and he smoked as well like just normal cigarettes so all our money went on his drugs and his cigarettes and God knows what else. I am like really fast forwarding here. There is just so much to this story that I, I don't want to go into. I'm just trying to keep it basic um, and telling you guys like what I feel comfortable telling you with. <sighs> so we got married, wedding was horrible. I had, I cut my, let's have a funny story. My fringe is like way up here in my wedding pictures because I tried to cut a V fringe and it didn't work. Um, so I had to even out the edges and then that left my fringe like way up here. And it was such a mess. We did the wedding on like the cheapest way we could. Cheap, cheap and cheerful. But it was around this time that he started messaging other women and um his best friend at the time james had a girlfriend called gabby gabby had gabby told i think gabby told james that they had slept together or something and of course i did i to this day i do not know if they have like i don't know but being still in that web of manipulation i was like nah he wouldn't do that he wouldn't do that. i had people phone me like years before phone me and say i just want you to know that i slept with your boyfriend um i i didn't know he was in a relationship i had no idea again i don't to this day i don't know if that's true or not at, at, at the time i was like yeah whatever no nah, that didn't happen he loves me babe he loves me you don't need to go sh why is he going shopping for burgers when he's got steak at home there were so many so many red flags so many red flags and i just chose to ignore every single one he didn't have his own phone he had his own phone at the start of the relationship and then i've got no idea when but he he used to get in strops and break stuff throw stuff throw god knows what you you name it he threw it and broke it um, and he broke his phone and wouldn't buy another one so he used to take my phone off me and i think now it's like i can i totally see this as a manipulation tactic but at the time of course you don't that whole from our wedding to the time i left he was messaging another woman one that i am a hundred percent certain of um she has made a youtube video all about her experiences with him and how he fucked her over he did her dirty and he turned us against each other he was like this girl's online saying really bad stuff about you um, she's making videos about you she's taking the piss out of you she laughed when our baby died this is all stuff that he was telling me putting in my ear it was a hundred percent to keep us away from each other because you're not gonna chat to someone like that are you you're not gonna be friends with someone like that this was a tactic to keep us from being friends and keep us from talking and she lived on the other side of the freaking world there was no reason for us to talk we never would have found each other had he not have said well this girl's talking about you um and the whole time he was messaging her messaging her saying i was boring i was a slut <laughs> <laughs> a slut that is a big fucking joke chatting to god knows how many men this is all untrue like none of this happened i was so in love with this man that i didn't do anything like this <laughs> see i'm getting angry again now i laugh when i'm angry because 
otherwise I will explode. This is just the range of emotions that my life has gone through. And yeah, they were talking. Um, all I know of that relationship is what I've heard from her. He never spoke to me about her. Um, or if if I ever tried to speak to him after it came out that they would, had been messaging each other, if I tried to speak to him, he'd get angry, throw stuff. I, all I know is what I've heard from her. When we eventually split up, he got with her straight away and he planned to move to New Zealand and live with her, which didn't happen. He ripped her off took loads of money from her and ripped her off. Sounds familiar. So I left um, a few years after we'd been married. My life began when I split up from him. He moved in with my mum actually. He, we lived in a rented flat. He hadn't been paying our rent so we got kicked out of our flat but that was around the time that we split up. So I moved in with my friend. God, this is so fucking terrible. He was just ripping people off left, right and centre. He was living on the streets he claims but my mum said he had stayed at hers and he robbed her. He stole from my mum. He stole money and he stole cigarettes from my stepdad and like my mum let him stay there rent free and he, he stole from her. All while using her internet to carry on this love affair with his mystery woman. I don't feel sad anymore. Like just I feel like a switch has just gone off and I don't feel sad. I feel angry. Like I just, the, uh, it's that TikTok song. I was far too scared to hit him but I would hit him in a heartbeat now. Like I would fucking knock you out now. When you sit down and you open that box and everything that you have locked away, the statutory rape, the not being able to consent, you cannot legally consent at, at 14. You are a child. Years of the same thing. Years of just being shut away from people, friends, family, being lonely. That's the best word I can use, is I was so lonely. My mental health yeah, plummeted so much. <sighs> um, all of this is like, I never sit down and just go through it. I sit, I, you know, I'll be doing something and a little bit of it will pop in my head like a scene from a movie. And, and I never sit down and process everything. And this isn't even everything. This is just the bits that I feel comfortable talking about. There is there is so much more to this story. I can't take back, I can't take back any of it, but I can change the narrative of it. I can change the way I deal with it in the future. I actually only came to realize all of this trauma very recently. It was only like within the last two years that I have been processing all of this. It was like a dimmer switch. People say you get a light switch. This was a dimmer switch. And it was, um, it was very carefully being turned brighter and brighter. I have seen said person. Um, the last time I saw them was a few years ago. And we had a brief chat. This was before I was starting to realize what happened. And we had a brief chat. He asked me for money. <laughs> he asked me a lot for money. Can I help him move? Can I do this? Can I do that? Can I help him? Because he sees that I'm in a happy relationship and um, he sees that as, I, I don't know, continued to try and take advantage of me. And my, my partner is the most wonderful person ever. At no point, he was always like, I don't want you to do this. Like if I lent my ex money, which I did a few years ago, because I was still in that mindset of like, yeah, you know, we had this shit relationship, but that's all it was. It was both ways, you know? So I lent him money and my partner was always like, I don't want you to do this. It's your money. You can do what you want, but please know that he's taken advantage of you. And I was always like, no, you, you weren't there. You didn't understand. I gave Ben a huge fucking apology <laughs> when this dimmer switch started to come on. I was like, thank you so much for just being that little Jiminy Cricket in my head and helping me see. What actually helped me really, really see and really come to terms with everything was my daughter. My daughter is seven. And at the time that I started processing everything, she was five. <laughs> and me and Ben, my husband, were sat on the sofa one day just chatting about how gorgeous she is and how it won't be long before she's in high school. We were like, God, in in a few years she'll be high school and then I was like oh my god high school is when I started going off the rails and that was the first click of that dimmer switch right at that moment it was that's only a few years from what my daughter is now that I was going out I ha I was having sex I was doing drugs I was drinking all under this one person and and that's what made me realize that I had to unlock this box. And I had a chat with Ben and um, 
and I was like and I got really really deep because I don't talk I never talk I never talk about my feelings I never talk this is how I get everything out I make YouTube videos I'll say like a little thing here and there in a random video um, and that's how I get it out I don't like to talk about my feelings so this is actually very very hard for me to do I've been planning to do this for so long. I've been psyching myself up because if this can help one person then it's worth it. And I'm tired of keeping it locked in a box in my head and blaming myself, getting taken advantage of, being groomed. None of this was my fault. And I know I'm gonna get trolls, like of course it was your fault. I was 14. This has been very hard. I know I've been laughing and joking. That's how I deal with things. I make a joke of it. But this has been, this is like the most therapy I've had in years. <laughs> and it was all because of you guys, because I made that silly TikTok. All the comments that were saying like, oh my God, that I had the same thing. You guys made, it sounds really horrible, but you guys going through a similar thing made me feel like I am not alone. That it wasn't my fault. Okay, now we turn into tears. It wasn't my fault. I'm not alone. And that I can get through this and it was heartbreaking to read so many messages of people that have gone through the same thing but i thank you so much for letting me for pushing me to make this and to get it out there i don't care who sees this i don't care i'm a very open person i don't care who knows my story because that who i was then is not who i am now that 14 year old child that was groomed is not the person that I am today. I'm not ashamed of my past. And today I am safe from my predator, but so many children are not. Um, a few of the comments on my TikTok were, I'm in this position right now. And it's like, please, like just, just see your worth. Don't be me in the future trying to deal with everything because you refused to deal with it then and there and you locked it away. Because trust me, it doesn't help. There is always someone there that will listen. There is always someone that would help. You can go to your doctors. You can go to a school, a teacher. If you can't go to a parent, there is always someone that will listen and there is always someone that can help. I don't blame anybody for what I went through aside from him, but I wish so much that an adult, though I know I wouldn't have listened, I wish so much that an adult had put their foot down and, and stopped it because I didn't have that and I th I don't like to live with regrets I never live with regrets like it happens I can't change it but if someone had helped maybe it wouldn't have gone on for so long maybe I could have had a normal teenage life not one filled with sex and self-loathing which isn't as fun as it sounds <laughs> One of the last times I actually saw this person, we had a um, a chat and this was before I was realizing everything. And I still thought like we had an all right relationship and it wasn't what it actually is. And he said to me, he actually said to me, you know, you know what we had was right. You know, you know what we had was okay, don't you? You know that it wasn't like this sick and twisted thing that people make it out to be. Do I? Do I know that? Because now I have a clear mind and all I can see is a 23 year old who got a 14 year old drunk in the park, took her back to his house and statutory raped her. That's all I can see. Now like so many puzzle pieces fit together and it's like, I bet that, I think that was his guilt. I, he would never apologize to me. Oh my God, no. Last time I saw him, he told me I was getting older. Told me I had crow's feet. Um, bitch, where? Yeah, told me I'd gotten fatter. Do you know what? I swear on my daughter's life, I think he was scared because I do YouTube and I do these, and I've done videos about our relationship before, but I was not in the right mindset. I was in the, we had a nice relationship mindset. Now I am in the fuck everyone who knew us mindset. And I think he was scared that I was gonna do this. And you know, it's come a few years after I last saw him, but hey ho, here it is. You groomed me. I was 14, you were 23. I was on a weekend leave from a psychiatric hospital. I was dealing with self-harm, suicide, depression, and I'm sure that was just a present with a bow on it when you saw me. I see with so much clearer eyes now. Yes, they've got tears in them, but they are so much clearer than they were a few years ago. Really, really hope that my story of, because when you're in it, you don't see it. And I really hope that this helps just one person realize that it isn't right. <laughs> it isn't right. Yes, you may love each other. Yes, he may love you. If you are under age, 
you are a child. You're a child. I don't care if you met at 14, you ended up getting married seven kids later, you're really, really happy. You were still a child. And no matter what I agree to at the time, this isn't about like taking back consent. It's nothing like that. It's about being unable to consent at 14. At 14, you are you are not legally able to give consent. Being plied with alcohol and taken advantage of is exactly what happened to me. My story has a happy ending though. I am very happy now. I mean, not right this second. I have a wonderful, wonderful husband. I have a seven year old daughter who is my freaking world. And God help anyone that dates her in the future because I am gonna be down your neck making sure you treat her right. I don't want to end this crying. I didn't want to cry at all throughout this but I'm a fanny pants. I will never see him again and that is the best thing that could ever happen to me because I am able to move on knowing that I won't run into him. I'm sad it took so long for me to see. When you lock things away trauma takes a long time to break out but it will break out. It'll get you. So if you're going through anything similar, dissimilar, anything traumatic, please deal with it. Because if you don't, it'll just, it'll get so much worse. I feel like a weight, a really big weight has been lifted. I wanna thank you, thank you all, everybody who commented on my video, my TikTok. This is because of you, and I thank you from the bottom of my heart. And anyone in currently in a similar situation or any situation, that needs someone to talk to i'm gonna put helplines in the description below please reach out to them that they, they are there to help i will see you guys very soon with another video where i'm back to my normal chipper happy dark humorous self being able to move on from the trauma and and not letting it consume me anymore much love guys stay weird